Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I am Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled that you're with us today. If you enjoyed our music called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Dore, please feel free to download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to Alzheimer's Speaks, we're about sound information, not just sound bites. We want to talk with real people in the trenches that understand practically what's going on and how they can help you. And so I know you're really going to enjoy this show. I'm proud to announce that this show is in partnership with the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team, who provide a lot of resources for caregivers and people living with dementia, especially during the pandemic. And the series is called Dementia, Caring and Coping During the Pandemic. We are meeting with several different panelists throughout this series. And I will be introducing you to Jenny West, our guest today in just a minute. But I always like to give a few shout outs and to also remind people that our shows are all archived. So you can check them out. We've been doing this for over 10 years. First, I want to give a shout out to the Memory Cafe directory. Dave Wiedrich has pulled these together for five different countries. They are absolutely fantastic. And if you're not familiar with the Memory Cafe, they are a support group, or I like to call them a gathering of friends of people with dementia and their care partners to learn and support one another throughout the journey. You can go to memorycafedirectory.com to learn more and to find out where the virtual meetings are, go to Cafe Connect and you will find um, about 100 cafes that are virtual that pretty much anybody anywhere can sign up for. I personally do three of them. Arthur Senior Care, we have a memory cafe on the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month at two o'clock Eastern, that's uh, one o'clock Central Time, 12 Mountain Time, and 11 a.m. Pacific Time. And then also do one with Artists uh, Senior Living of Maplewood, Minnesota. And that one is on the third Wednesday of each month, same times. And you can always reach out to me at Lori at alzheimerspeaks.com. In addition, I want to shout out to Coral Health, who is still allowing people to download two of their music apps, Music First and Coral Faith. So check them out at coralhealth.com. That's C-O-R-O health.com. And then Dementia Map, which is a global resource directory, uh, Dave Wiedrich and I just launched here right before the holidays. And it is for people with dementia, their care partners, both family and professionals, um, as well as organizations to try to assist them to find what it is they need when they need it in a simple fashion. It also helps raise profiles of businesses that are listed in there, but we have both free and paid listings because we don't want money to be an obstacle when people are searching for resources. We want them to be able to find everybody easily and go to them directly. Last, let's go ahead and hear from the Foot Bar Walker and we'll be right back. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? 
struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. So let me go ahead and introduce you to Jenny West. Jenny is the community educator for caregiving and aging services at Family Means, which is in Stillwater, Minnesota. She is responsible for the community awareness, educational classes, and she facilitates support groups like memory cafes and also teaches a powerful tools for caregiver, which she is a facilitator and a master trainer in. Uh, This organization offers a lot. And now with COVID, you don't have to be in Minnesota to participate because they've gone virtual with a lot of these things. Well, Jenny, I am so excited to have you on the show. So welcome, first and foremost. And second, did you have a good uh, holiday season? Yes, we did. Thanks, Lori. It was a little bit different, but uh, we decided to do different things that we normally wouldn't do. So uh, it was very nice and relaxing. Well, good. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled that you can be part of this Dementia Caring and Coping during the pandemic series. But before we start with our line of questioning, can you just tell our audience if you have been personally touched by dementia in your own family or circle of friends? Yeah, I have actually. Looking back, um, even all the way back to high school, I did a lot of volunteer work with elders and um, have a lot of experience, both personally and professionally, for those who might have a dementia diagnosis. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. So let's start with having you tell us about the mission of Family Means and how that relates to both people with dementia and their care partners. Yeah, so really at Family Means, our goal is really just to meet people where they're at at the time of need. We are very lucky to have our caregiving and aging team We also have financial solutions because oftentimes we know caregivers sometimes struggle with finances and long-term planning. And we also have counseling and therapy for individuals who may need it, especially upon receiving a dementia diagnosis. And then we, a little offshoot, um, we do have youth development and then our Center for Grief and Loss. So we have a, a lot of different departments within family means. um, And truly our goal is just meeting individuals where they're at and being able to give them resources um, and solutions to help their lives be better. Wonderful. Uh, You guys do such great work. And and I love you kind of have this umbrella over your your communities in terms of what are the needs and we're going to figure something out and, and be there for you, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, through the whole COVID thing, you know, starting in March, you know, that's had a huge impact on pretty much every person in the world. And I'm assuming it did on family means as well. And wondering if you can describe the impact of that initially. How did you guys cope? How did you pivot? How did your how did your clients and your community deal with all of this? Yeah, I mean, it was for all of us, it was a strange time, but it was a time of a kind of immediate action. We had virtual support groups and memory cafes starting the first week of April. We were able to meet as a team before we left the office permanently or for for this time. And we were, we really sat down for a couple of days and just divvied out responsibilities and what we could do. So we initially, you know, started our virtual platform, you know, right in the beginning of April, but really our main focus was just reaching out to the clients, oftentimes mostly by telephone and asking what their needs were, especially what, whether or not they were connected and had resources and equipment to connect virtually. And then Um, kind of kept two lists remaining or still going on of who has access to what so we know that we can still reach them appropriately. Wonderful. That is a really quick action. I have talked with so many people around the world. And uh, to be honest, I've been disappointed with how many organizations didn't step up, Mm -hmm. you know, sat back and thought, well, this, this will pass. And then, and then we'll just come back in. And 
you know, some I'm just seeing in the last month stepping up. I mean, they sure. really waited. And so that's fantastic that you guys took immediate action. Over this period of time, or I should ask first, were you doing any virtual stuff with clients prior to COVID, you know, that might have made it a little easier pivot for you, or was this kind of all new? This was all brand new, you know, especially just having everything done virtually. So, you know, the staff also had a huge learning curve. And, you know, looking back at it, I think those first few, you know, months, probably the first two months, we were kind of also teaching individuals how to use the equipment, you know, making sure that they can get on appropriately, appropriately and they understand how to mute and unmute themselves. So, you know, there's that learning curve, but now we're finding access and ideas that even going forward, we know that we'll keep because it really works for some of our caregivers, whether they travel a distance, just time, timing of groups. Some people have really enjoyed having that opportunity where Others also really look forward to being in person uh, when it's safe to do so. Yeah, I found, um, you know, I've always done a lot of stuff virtually through Zoom and stuff. But what I found with my uh, people with dementia primarily was they sat back and kind of smiled and said, oh, now the rest of the world's going to know what it's like to feel like you have dementia when everyone, you know, kind of pushes back and you can't connect because mm -hmm. so many of them lost their friends and families felt that impact as well. And so many of them said, well, we can teach people how to do this. I mean, if yeah. we can do this as people with dementia. And so a lot of them took a lot of pride in helping and getting people to understand these are real valid relationships and connections you're making. And I also saw, and I don't know if you saw this, but people going, they were so excited that they could do this because there was such great fear around it. It kind of reminds me when I was younger, and computers came about and you were scared to touch anything because what if you broke it, <laughs> you know, type thing. And now we just know to do the undo or reboot it and life will be fine and <laughs> stuff. But they, you know, I, I, people literally would squeal and go, we can have our, our, uh, our prayer group. We can, you know, we, our knitting group can still get together and chat our book club, our, you know, all these different things that they had lost. They were seeing, oh, I can use this technology to reconnect to family, friends, whatever it might be. And to me, that was so cool. Yeah, we even found, especially our groups for supporting individuals with memory loss. I mean, those were our strongest groups at the very beginning and said, no, we want this. You know, we want to still make this happen. And, and what we were seeing, too, is individuals supporting one another. Oh, I just had a Google Meet with my doctor. Oh, really? H how did you do that? And so then they would learn from one another and support one another. And so, like you said, kind of getting over that fear um, of how to use technology and then using it to their advantage and remaining connected with the people that they want to. Yeah, the, the shared learning and the vulnerability on everybody's part, knowing what it feels like is really cool because they just feel so safe and it yeah. just evens the playing field out for, for all of us. And well, even with us today, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be flashing on the screen or if it's going to be a solid connection. I mean, learning that a lot of these things aren't in our control, just kind of like with dementia, some mm -hmm. things you can um, maneuver and other things you just have to learn how to adapt to. So wonderful. Again, kudos to you guys. Have you, from the beginning to now, what would you say has changed in terms of your mode of madness to stay connected and, and provide services? You know, a lot of it is, it's kind of exciting because it, it challenges us all to do things different. And it has changed our idea of what that different might be. We are still making our, you know, weekly and biweekly telephone calls because that seems to work out really well on an individual basis. And along with our weekly, you know, support groups and our group respite, what we found too is even though we have to stay distant, we can still be connected. We actually partnered with the Washington County Libraries and got our own Family Means library card. And now we're checking out the memory minder kits that are available actually at all libraries. And we're literally driving them to individuals' homes 
and rotating them every two weeks. We go to the door, we knock, we have our masks on, we don't go inside, we drop off the kit, they, we exchange another one. And so we still have that opportunity to connect and give a bag of activities for that couple to do for those two weeks until they get a new one. And then we also, we were pretty excited, and I think many organizations have done this, but we were able to purchase some artificial companion cats and dogs and now give those out on loan to individuals, as well as we have a handful of iPads that we're able to loan out um, and educate people on how to use that so they can still be connected, especially during the upcoming winter months. Very cool. I That really excites me that you guys have tapped into a way to get those memory minder kits out because mm -hmm. they are just such a great, great tool. It's been fun to see the different libraries pick up on that concept around the country and uh, know that it started here kind of in the Roseville Shoreview area. It's it's a very neat. They're, they're so helpful. For those of you that don't know, there is something in there, uh, you know, activities piece for the person with dementia, sometimes their care partner. There's also kind of a resource piece, usually a music piece. I think they are still putting in kind of a list of, of books too that they have. So there's just lots of really good, uh, good information and all of them are a little bit different and they've got them for different stages and different types. And I believe they were in the process. I don't know if they completed even putting one together for children to understand, you know, a little bit more about dementia as well. So at this point, you're doing everything virtual, nothing's in person at all in, in, in terms of other than maybe dropping stuff off. Correct. Yep. Everything remains virtual. In fact, about three months ago, we started our group respite that had been four hours long. Um, we are we are now doing that virtually, and it's actually going quite well. The major modification that we did is we reduced it from four hours to 90 minutes, just because we also are all experiencing Zoom fatigue, <laughs> but it is an opportunity for our group respite, our day out program to reconnect with individuals. And that's working out really well. And, and even our volunteers are learning how to, you know, play games online and um, interacting with others. So it's, like I said, we, we all have to start thinking outside of the box and looking at what are some possibilities, what can we do in order for people to know that we're still thinking of them, we're still supporting them and, and staying connected during this time. Fantastic. What other types of services and activities are you, are you providing? Can you go a little bit deeper into some of those? Sure. Uh, we are still doing our evidence-based powerful tools for caregiver series. And that is a six-week series that is an educational opportunity for caregivers to come together online and go through six days or six, six times of learning really how to care for themselves, stress management, self-care, communication, um, long-term planning. Um, it's a really great opportunity, and that has actually proven to be very beneficial, again, because the We've had people all over the Twin Cities join us now because it can be done virtually. So that's been really nice. Our second series is Shaping Your Tomorrow, which is a 10-week series for the individual who has dementia diagnosis and their care partner. And each week we go through an educational topic for an hour of education as a large group. And then the second hour is a peer support group. So caregivers go with my coworker, Sarah, and the individuals who have a dementia diagnosis stay with me. And we just have an, an opportunity to connect and share and ask questions and kind of talk about our weeks and what are we doing to stay busy and what, what, what can we plan, especially we had a lot of conversations about, you know, going into the winter months, what can we do? And then another neat opportunity that we've been doing virtually that we never thought of was we have a virtual reality headset and we have two different labs. One is an Alzheimer's diagnosis and the other is a Lewy body diagnosis with Parkinson's. And these labs are literally, I'll, I'll show you, it's a headset um, that I put on and I go through the lab itself 
But because of Zoom, everybody is able to see what I see in the headset. And so we lit literally are in the person's shoes, experiencing what it may be like having a dementia diagnosis, um, which is a huge learning curve for all of us and an opportunity to then really explore um, our thoughts and feelings after we've gone through this experience and what it was like and what we have found. Um, we've been actually able to do this all over the state of Minnesota, which we never would have thought of, you know, pre-pandemic. But what we're really learning is that it's really increasing the empathy of our community members at large, because we know that a dementia diagnosis is invisible. And we have the opportunity to show more compassion um, when we might encounter somebody who we think may have a dementia diagnosis. So definitely conversations to increase the awareness around the variety of diagnoses, as well as increasing the empathy. So that's been really exciting and something that we never would have thought of before. And it saves other people, you know, time and transportation as well, just getting to our events. So Zoom, it, it can work for us. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, people miss the in-person and the hugs and just, yeah. you know, just the atmosphere of that. But I think people are relaxing a little bit more and like me, you know, grabbing a cup of coffee and just, you know, having having a real conversation with people and not feeling so on edge with things, which then, you know, dies everything down a little a little bit and, and pulls the nerves back. Now, with these, is there a cost to people? Is there a, you know, is there a fee or a sliding scale or are they free? How, do, how does all of that work with the variety of services that you have? Sure. With all of our programs, we do have a sliding fee scale based on the individual's income. And so it's just a conversation piece. You know, obviously our support groups and memory cafes are open and free to the public. The powerful tools and shaping your tomorrow series does have a fee um, that we're happy to discuss. You know, we're fortunate enough that at Family Means, our goal is for an individual to receive this information. And so if there's a hardship, um, we completely understand and are able to do that sliding fee scale. Okay. And, and does that go with the virtual reality piece then too? Yes, okay, mm -hmm. great. And are you comfortable sharing what those fees are in case listeners are curious or would you rather that they call in? Uh, well, they can certainly call in. Powerful Tools is $60 for the six-week series. And the other ones are often just discussed privately. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, for, that, that's not bad at all for, for what yeah. you're getting, you know, in that. So that's, that's fantastic. What have you, what kind of response are you getting from people with the respite care? Because I know that that's been such a huge need. You know, people are, are kind of shut in, needless to say, and feel almost trapped and have lost so much of their support. And many of them just relied on just, you know, for care partners, having that free time to take a nap or do errands or whatever it might be. Um, sometimes it's just a feeling where, you, you know, you don't have to be needed. You, you don't have to be on call you know, mm -hmm. that getting rid of that kind of high alert thing. And then for the person with dementia too, I think so many times everyone's like, oh, it's, it's for the, the care partner, but it's important for the person with dementia too, to be able to have those other connections, because I don't think there's anybody I've ever met that wants to be tied to somebody 24 seven. You know, yeah. we all, we all like our individuality and taking our breaks as much as we love and care for somebody that's just kind of a natural human instinct to connect with others. And so it really is giving to giving back to both parties um, is yeah. my belief there. Yeah, respite has definitely been the hardest hit during this pandemic for the reasons that you just said, Lori. And our volunteers have done a phenomenal job, you know, again, thinking outside of the box. And we had one volunteer that would call and watch a movie with the person who has the dementia diagnosis and their caregiver could go do something else and they would just talk throughout the movie. And, you know, that's why we also started our group respite online. And although we had to shorten it to 90 minutes, that's still something familiar or something new for an individual to experience. And, and like you said, being able to connect with other people, I think we did it kind of at the right time. We had every, 
we had all of our programs kind of up and running and now we're just building more on. What I have found too, as you had said, people are becoming more relaxed and feeling more comfortable. Uh, Unfortunately, it's becoming a new normal, but that's okay that this is becoming a new normal because people, some people really like it and they may feel more comfortable putting something in the chat room or chatting somebody privately than saying it out loud in a group. And so there can be a sense of security here as well using virtual platforms, but understanding that there definitely needs to be that balance. And people do just, it's more difficult to read body language for over Zoom. Um, it's much easier to do in person. And, and when it's safe to do so, we'll definitely resume those because that connection is so important for everybody and that respite. That's why we took on, you know, delivering the memory reminder kits up and down Washington County, because then it is something new that they can do together. We did a survey a month ago and really asked our clients, you know, what was, what is going well? We know that there are a lot of challenges and and we'll talk about those challenges, but we also want to hear from you what is going well. And what we had heard is that being outside and again, slowing down and, you know, I can't change the diagnosis. I can't change the pandemic. So what can I do? I'm going to enjoy the moment where I am. So there was a lot of resiliency that we found um, in those surveys. And it was very nice to see the caregiver practicing that self-care. And, you know, we're all hoping for the very best that we can be in person soon, but not trying to get ahead of ourselves. Hopefully with good weather here in Minnesota, people can be outside as long as possible when it's not icy and snowy. Yeah, it's nice to get that fresh air and be able to be Mm -hmm. out and about. It's just hard to say, you know, what's going to come in these next few months for sure. I wanted to ask, too, in terms of all you're doing, what were your biggest challenges and frustrations (laughs) with trying to pivot with things? I think the biggest frustration was realizing, you know, so many things are at work that you need you know, and you can't possibly bring everything home. And so there was definitely an adjustment uh, for everybody, you know, working home, working independently at home, but then also keeping up those connections with your coworkers. We at Family Means, we have a meeting on Monday morning and Friday afternoon, and we talk about what we're going to do in the week. And then we talk about what we've accomplished, you know, where we need help from each person, because you don't get to walk down the hallway and, and quickly grab somebody for five minutes. And so that was just a big challenge of finding that pattern of what's working for individuals. So that was really good. I think we've done very well with it. And then also just learning where our clients are at and what they need. Like I said, some people love having this virtual opportunity. Some people are like, no, (laughs) I don't want to do anything until we can go back in person. And so kind of keeping a list of, you know, who is doing things online? Who do we need to call? We have volunteers that are constantly, we're sending cards out to our clients just to make sure that people know that they are still being thought of and still connecting with one another. And so that push on learning something new, because that's sometimes not comfortable for all of us, but kind of pushing through that uncomfortableness and becoming comfortable using virtual opportunities and platforms. Yeah, I think that was a real important piece too. You were talking about staff connecting. Mm-hmm. As of, I mean, just the frustrations we're all going through in terms of being able to still bounce ideas off. And when you're you know, when you see the need being so huge, sometimes it's easy just to dive into that and forget kind of like a, like a regular care partner, Mm -hmm. Uh, forget about taking care of yourself and your own needs. And how do I ease this out? And it's important for me to still stay connected to, to my group too, and to be as functional as possible because those shared ideas. um, And sometimes it's just support of, Hey, you're not, you're not alone there. (laughs) This is happening to me and ideas of this is how I'm, I'm moving through that. Um, really can make a big, big difference there. You had mentioned that in the future, you know, you might keep some of this virtual reality stuff going on, which I think is really important too, because what I've heard from so many is they're reaching people they wouldn't have reached before because it was too difficult maybe to maneuver to come in, um, or they didn't know what their day was going to be like, or they didn't want to be that inconsistent person that we might make it this time and not make it another time. And because 
they felt an embarrassment that they couldn't get through everything in their day to show up. And, and so then all of a sudden the group almost feels more like a burden to them um, because of, they have this self shame. And I know that that's not coming from your organization or really any organization, but it's just that thing of being part and wanting to be there and, and can't. And sometimes those frustrations can mount for people. So I, I'm glad to hear that, it, you know, you think you'll be getting together as soon as you can, you know, in a safe manner, but then also still doing the Zoom to allow people to to participate that fashion. Have you thought of merging the two at all? Or is that just too far out into the future where you do kind of a hybrid? So you have your in-person meeting and then those that can't make it join via Zoom? Yeah, we've actually had the opportunity during this time to reconfigure our desk room, our large community room to allow that as an opportunity. So Family Means has started thinking about what possibly could work in the future for everyone. I know our support groups for adult children, caregiving for, you know, their parents or older relatives and, and um, raising their young families, that has actually grown quite large during this pandemic. And so it is a an opportunity of reaching people that we may not have reached before and looking and thinking outside of the box about what kind of possibilities could work going into the future. But we will definitely be keeping some of these virtual components too, because they are helpful for so many. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Now with, with you guys, are you working out of the office or are you working out of your homes? Yeah, for our staff, we are working out of our homes. There, our financial solutions department, because of their computer systems and and finances, they're not allowed to work from home because of that access that they need. And so we do have staff that are in the building, but we want to try to keep them as safe as possible. So since everybody has been set up, we are all working from home. If we need to go in, we certainly can, but we try to um, keep that at a minimum. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting how many companies are talking about maybe looking differently at how they even structure employees and the cost of the sticks and the bricks and all of those types of things. So it's going to be very interesting to see the impact on buildings as a whole and family structures. And I know people are looking at new homes that offer more of an office space in Mm -hmm. I was in a meeting last night and somebody said, oh, you're, you're in a different location. And he's like, well, the location I've been in has been my daughter, my teenage daughter's bedroom. And that's getting old for her. And we had to respect that. So I needed to find a new space. And so everyone is, is kind of grappling with that. What kind of advice would you share to those living with dementia and those that are caring for them, you know, their family members right now in terms of dealing with isolation and and restrictions during this pandemic? I think the the biggest thing is still, um, as we always tell individuals and, and share what we do at Family Means, is that you're not alone. And sometimes that can really be difficult to hear when you're, you know, when you're feeling so isolated, but that there are still support systems available. You know, many organizations are still up and running, but it does look differently. But to not be afraid to reach out and know that services are still going on. We're still available to support families and to not try to do it alone. Again, all of our services are are everybody's is different, but we're still here. We're still working. We're still open despite the challenges and we're available to help and support you where you need it. Fantastic. And how about to other organizations that, you know, may be struggling, trying to pivot during this time, any advice to them? You know, I really think it's, as I said, just kind of thinking outside of the box. How can we work with one another to support each other, organization to organization? It was really nice, you know, to have the conversation with Washington County Libraries to say, hey, like, is this okay? Can I keep them for a little bit longer because I'm rotating them? Absolutely. So again, just thinking outside of the box, especially during this pandemic, but it also has shown us 
that the importance of working with other organizations, because at the end of the day, we want to support our caregivers and those who are living with dementia. And so how can, as an organization, how can we best do that? And sometimes it's partnering with people that we hadn't thought of before. And so that really has been a neat opportunity to go outside of our own comfort zone and ask, hey, can we do this together? So that's been a really enlightening and a neat opportunity. Wonderful. I love the collaboration. And I think, you know, this is really a moment in time to get creative and to, you know, strip away all those things that we thought were barriers Mm -hmm. and get to the crux of how do we make it work? Because everyone's budgets are tight, you know, everyone's staff is limited. I mean, there's, but the need has increased. And so how do we make this work? How do we make the clients feel comfortable as well as staff, you know, during all of this, it's been neat to see how people have pivoted and adjusted and in what time frames. with your organization, you've done it brilliantly, really quickly where others have really struggled with that. And I think a lot of that has to do with organizational philosophies and structures too. You know, we've got many organizations out there that well, we've always done it this way. And kind of like dementia, the pandemic's here to go, that ain't working anymore. (laughs) So let's figure out how to do it different, you know, and in some ways people have been able to reduce costs in terms of service delivery through this as well and have a broader reach. So that's been kind of interesting to watch too with things. So it'll be, it'll be interesting. I, I know we're all ready to kind of break out of jail and get our, get out of jail card free and, and be able to roam and mingle and, and laugh and love, and that'll come back. But in the meantime, you know, it's about being safe, but still, like you said, not feeling isolated, still being able to connect on other levels and empowering people to participate. For, for those that don't have, let's say computers, but like with Zoom, people can also just call in and listen without the video. Do you have any people participating on that level? We have had a couple individuals that just do the telephone um, conversation. And so a lot of times, you know, we really end all of our conversations with our clients. What else would be helpful? What else would you need? Because that's how we've developed our programs during the pandemic. You know, what would be helpful to you? What is something that would make your day a little bit brighter? We have actually delivered baskets to individuals three times so far. And um, again, we just drop them off wearing a mask, but it's just a basket of activities and letting them know hand sanitizer and masks that have been made by volunteers and activities, but just opportunities to know that somebody's thinking of them and just always asking our caregiver, you know, what else would be helpful? And, And as you had said, for the individual who is living with a dementia diagnosis, what can help you get through your day? What would make your day a little bit brighter? That's our starting point, and that's where we try to grow our programs and help those not feel alone and not feel isolated, but yet feel connected with their community. Fantastic. Well, I would love to uh, just give you this opportunity to uh, to invite you to join. I don't know if you've heard about Dementia Map, but it's a global resource directory that we just launched, and you guys would be such a fabulous asset to families and other professionals in terms of how you're doing things. You know, I would love, uh, well, for people just to visit. We just started right before the holidays. It's been really fun to see the response. And we have people with dementia on there who are providing resources and tools as well as uh, family members who have become advocates to professionals to you, you name it. And it's been really fun to see it grow. But we also have a calendar of events on there, which I think, you know, right now it's hard to know how to find so many of these services too. And again, we would love to love to have you be part of that. In the meantime, though, people can reach you by going to familymeans.org. Again, that's familymeans.org. And then you also have help for caregivers specifically. So if you go to uh, that website, familymeans.org, and then do a forward slash and then help dash for F-O-R dash caregivers, 
you'll get right to that section of their site. And then to email Jenny, you can reach her by J West W E S T at family means. They are located at 1875 Northwest Avenue South in Stillwater, but know that few are there. So don't be knocking on the door. <laughs> it's best to contact them by phone or virtually at this point, uh, because everyone's pretty much working out of the house. What you guys are doing is brilliant. And I can't thank you enough for sharing what you're doing here on the show. Really, really appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thank you for having me today, Lori. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you and give kudos to all of your coworkers as well. And those that are participating. It's, it's great to hear a company listen and ask what's, what do you need? You know, on a regular basis, I really think that's how we push progress forward. So again, you can go to familymeans.org. And of course, with Alzheimer's Speaks, you can always go to our main website, alzheimerspeaks.com. And Roseville AD, they are just a wonderful, wonderful resource and we'll have their email and uh, website listed because uh, they, they do a lot of really cool things there as well. One of them being in partnership with this series that we're doing right now. Thank you so much and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Hey everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.